Hey gang, I'm in Los Angeles, California today, back in Los Angeles. I'm at a cemetery called Angeles Rosedale, and we're here to pay our respects and walk to the grave of a very interesting woman, and her father was probably fairly infamous, and that would be Maria Rasputin, her father being Grigori Rasputin. So let's walk to her grave and let's talk about the Rasputin story. Very spooky story it is indeed. The cemetery here has a lot of old stones, interesting stones, and here we see a pyramid. Looks like it says Grigsby. And there are a few pyramids here. Now I will tell you that the the pyramids were popular in the 1920s because, well, thereabouts, that's when Carter and, uh, you know, those guys found King Tut and it just became the rage in America, well, all over the world, everything Egyptian was fashionable. So you see it in architecture, you see it in graves and, you know, architecture and statuary at cemeteries. Well, we saw it in we saw it in New Orleans at Metairie and that one. But anyway, I want to give credit to one of our viewers and subscribers. I never would have known that the daughter of Rasputin was even here in the United States, let alone LA. And we got to give credit to Purple Clove. Great email. Once I saw that note, that suggestion, I was all over it. And for those of you that don't know about Rasputin, well, you're going to be shocked and probably mystified by what I tell you. And let's talk about him a little bit first. Now, many of you know Rasputin. He was a, well, he was a self-proclaimed holy man kind of like a priest. He had befriended the family of Tsar Nicholas II in Russia, the last emperor of Russia. And I think it was about late 1906 that he began acting not only as a priest, but as a healer. Now he got very close to the, the Tsarina, Alexandra, the wife of course of Nicholas, and they had all these daughters. They had one son, Alexei, and he was a hemophiliac, very weak, skinny, very prone to, well, hemophiliac, very prone to getting in trouble when you have an accident, you can die, you get the slightest cut. Well, he was very close to Alexandra, the Tsarina, because he is reputed to have cured the boy when he was having one of his bouts, he was maybe even near death. And he came off as the hero, hero to the family. So he was running around in the social circles of Russian high society, the court, if you will. And it is in 1915, World War I, when Nicholas II left for St. Petersburg, he went to oversee the Russian armies fighting in World War I, fighting, and he left them alone, basically together. Now, there was no affair or anything going. It was just that, I mean, the deal was that they didn't, everybody was watching. They're like, who is this weirdo? Why is he here? Why is he influencing? Why is he influencing Nicholas and some of his decisions on our country, on our affairs? This is crazy. And they all wanted him, they wanted him dead. They wanted him out of there. So they were constantly plotting. Everybody hated him. And it was really, it was really, they were taking it on the chin. The Russian family, the reputation and all that. Everyone was so, you know, Nicholas goes away. He goes to the, to the front. And then, you know, they're really, Things are escalating, and of course the whispers and the rumors are escalating. And 
Next thing you know, the plot hatches where they want to kill him. We have these noblemen in the house and they hatch this plan. Well, what do they do? They, they lure him over. They lure him over and they get him in the basement nearby from where he was living. And they, they try to poison him with cyanide. They start with the cakes. <laughs> At first he didn't want to eat the cakes, but then he's like, okay, I think he ate a few cakes. No effect, the cyanide has no effect. Then they're like, let's try the wine. Three glasses of wine, cyanide, no effect. The power of Rasputin. And by the way, you couldn't even, it was really spooky to look in his eyes, you look at his pictures, they call it the Rasputin gaze. And he could just like captivate you. He had said to have all kinds of powers. All kinds of powers. So that didn't work. So the one guy goes, he goes from the basement, he goes upstairs, he's like, what do we do? And they're like, shoot him. So they go back down, he's like, hey, Rasputin, let me see your cross. Let's do a prayer. I want to see that up close. Pulls out the gun and he shoots him in the chest. And they're like, okay, he's dead. Let's go to his house. You, hey, you dress up as Rasputin. You know, it's like two in the morning. Go to his house like you're like he's going home so and make sure you're seen so they do that they come back they come back and Rasputin is still alive and he jumps up off the floor and he attacks them and they're like wrestling and grappling and they get the gun finally and they shoot him I think they shot him in the head and they shot him a couple more times the guy finally dies and then I think he was still moving they could not kill him. So what do they do? They tie him up, put him in a sheet, and they dump him in the freezing river under the ice. Well, he finally died <laughs> after that. Here's another pyramid up here. Let's go, let's go check that out. Yeah, so he finally got rid of him. Now, if you know the story of the end of the, the royal family, I mean, coinciding, they murder him, the word goes out. The war's going on. There's a revolution coming, the Bolsheviks. And at the end of the day, the Bolsheviks take over Lenin and then they kill the family. You know, they murder the, the, they murder the whole family and that's a whole nother story. So everybody's wiped out except the kids of Rasputin, except for the kids. Let's take a look here says chateau so this is another egyptian revival type of mausoleum take a quick look here well it doesn't look like there's much to see very interesting so yeah the kids of rasputin they're still alive and now everybody would be coming after them next By 1933, the Rasputin name was all but erased, with nearly all of his descendants dying under similar circumstances. Now to start with, of his seven children, only three had survived to adulthood. There was Matrona, Varvara, and Dmitri. When Rasputin was first holding sway in the royal court in St. Petersburg there, they had lived with their mother, that is, until 1913. It is then when he brought them to be with him in St. Petersburg, and that's when he relocated them there permanently. He was trying to secure a future, especially for his two daughters, and he wanted them to be upstanding ladies. So he had enrolled them, he had both the Matrona and Varvara into prep schools, staffed by some of the best teachers there, and he began to gradually introduce them to his new circle of friends in the royal court. Matrona would later recall that Nicholas II's children, the Tsar, resembled something like delicate china dolls. She would later recall in her memoirs 
The Tsar's children wanted to know everything about me. What gymnasium did I study at? Who does my hair? Who dresses me? Do you have any mechanical toys? Have you seen our yacht? What is your cow's name? And so on and so forth. The girls quickly befriended the Romanov children. Matrona soon changed her name, her lower class name, for a softer sounding name, Maria. That's when she got her name, Maria. Well, not long after they arrived, these anti-Rasputin sentiments began to grow more and more and more in St. Petersburg. And after their father was killed, well, they did the right thing. They all left town, but only Maria managed to leave the country. Not long before, she did marry a man named Boris Soloviev, an officer and loyal follower of Rasputin and, of course, of the royal family. And the first thing they would have to do to get out is they had to get new identification papers, and they did, and they left for Europe. Now, most could not head westward because of the war. And, you know, the trains, the Trans-Siberian, those often got stuck for months on end. So they took a different approach and they left on a ferry boat. Well, they were successful, although it took two years. They did get to Europe by way of Japan, Singapore, and then the Suez Canal. And during that journey, Maria delivered her firstborn. Now, they first settled in Berlin, and then they finally made it to Paris four years later. This escape actually saved Maria's life, otherwise she would have been killed. And it was something that couldn't be said for her brother and sister. Sadly, they were all killed. What happened to them? Well, going back to soon after their father's murder, Rasputin, Varvara returned to be with her brother. And in 1922, no surprise, they were stripped of all their rights and they were accused of being what they called then malignant elements. Well, things slowly started to get worse and worse for all of them. And in the 1930s, Dmitri, his mother, and his family were all arrested and sent to do labor in the north. And you know what that means. Well, they actually all died of dysentery. Meanwhile, Varvara simply disappeared, like thousands of others. One theory claims that she died of typhus in the 1920s, but we'll never know. Things weren't going so well either for Maria. Her husband, Boris, opened a restaurant, but the business was not successful. Most of the customers, being poor Russian emigrants, dined there, and they didn't pay their bills. They just dined on open tabs. And in 1924, he contacted the dreaded disease tuberculosis, and he died soon after that. By then, Maria had already two children, Marie and Tatiana, and having been left with nothing, well, first she worked as a housekeeper for rich families before taking a job as a dancer at the Empire Theater. She had taken ballet classes from the finishing school days, so that really helped, but she was really, they were really struggling along. But her life would soon change. In the 1930s, she was spotted by the director of what was called then Barnum, an American circus. And she got a job where she would perform in a cage with a lion. Well, she said, well, having fled the revolution as well as the wars, a lion cage doesn't scare me. <laughs> I'm not afraid. So the infamous name Rasputin played a huge role in this. Of course, that's what they wanted. And they wanted to play up on that. Of course, the public showed great interest in seeing what was billed as Maria Rasputina, the daughter of the mad monk, made famous by his exploits in Russia. And they had billboards and advertising on posters. And Maria had the ability, actually, to tame wild animals with nothing but her inherited Rasputin gaze, so they said, the Rasputin gaze, and that really got, that really drew the people in. So Maria toured almost all of Europe and then the United States with the show. Well, sadly, it all came to a crashing end in Miami. 
she was somehow savagely attacked by a polar bear. She survived. She went through lengthy surgeries, recovery. She had to stay in the hospital for a long time. And, well, that ended her career as an animal tamer. During World War II, Maria worked as a riveter, like Rosie the Riveter, at an American shipbuilding factory, so she did her part. And after World War II, she transitioned to weapons factories, where she worked and worked until she got very old. She had received her U.S. citizenship in 1945, the end of World War II, And she passed away in 1977. She was almost 80 years old. She does have surviving descendants that reside here in California. Now, we're at her grave here, and very interesting, I was here earlier at another time scouting, and I took a picture, and you can see that the ground over where she is buried very interesting the shape right over what is either her casket in the vault or sometimes they just bury the casket I don't know but I've seen that when I was in St. Louis I watched a burial they just they just buried the casket you know no one was even around anyway something has failed down there because the earth all kind of in a line just went down And it looks like in some places it went down 12 inches. So you have to wonder if something, the vault or the casket itself, caved in. I'm going to tell you, we all don't realize this, but the earth that is laid over the the burial weighs a lot. It's, I think it's about 100, if you have compacted soil from my architecture days, that's about 100 pounds per cubic foot. Now, if you add that all up, There's about three to five tons of soil that's, you know, if it's four feet or so on top of soil. So that is a lot. I mean, imagine a three or five ton boulder sitting on top of the vault. I mean, that's the same size as, well, a midsize sedan, automobile. There's a lot of weight pushing down. So something's going on down there. And I don't know, it's kind of spooky. But anyway, rest in peace. I'm glad to know that Maria was able to live her life in America and escape the horrors of communist Russia. Rest in peace, Maria.